Today is the 120th anniversary of the day that Nietzsche died. And so in his honor, I will be reading a couple of passages from the fourth book of the Fröhliche Wissenschaft of the Gay Science, uh, which is a book that's already pregnant with the Zarathustra. And it's the book where the death of God is mentioned, but it's also the book where Amor Fati and the eternal recurrence of the same are mentioned. In the fourth book of the Gay Science, Nietzsche begins on the Amor Fati, and it's dedicated to Saint January, Sanctus Januarius, to the holy month of January. And the passage begins, For the new year, I'm still alive, I still think. I must still be alive because I still have to think. Sum ergo Cogito, cogito ergo sum, as Nietzsche here refers to Descartes. Today, everyone allows himself to express his dearest wish and thoughts. So I too want to say what I wish from myself today and what thought first crossed my heart. What thought shall be the reason, warrant and sweetness of the rest of my life? I want to learn more and more how to see what is necessary in things as what is beautiful in them. Thus, I will be one of those who make things beautiful. So you see, there's a connection between necessity, consequence and beauty. Thinking and being alive for Nietzsche are identical or belong together rather and there is, however, also to thinking there is consequence. And this now must necessarily be affirmed. Amor fati is what he calls this. Amor fati, let that be my love from now on. I do not want to wage war against ugliness. So he wants to move away from being against anything and still be able to say yes in a non rationalizing way. I do not want to accuse, very importantly, I do not even want to accuse the accusers. Let looking away be my only negation. And all in all and on the whole, someday I want to, I want only to be a yes sayer. So he does not want to accuse, he does not want to oppose, for opposing requires one to create one's identity in opposition to something or someone else. But still, the looking away is, as his negation, still is not reactive, but is active, because looking to look away, one first needs to look at something in order to then look away. And that is his negation. It's a negation that's at, same, at the same time is an overcoming and also a self-overcoming. And his saying yes then is a yes out of this looking away, out of this initial negation. That's how the book begins. That what, that's what he wishes for himself. But it's very important to see that Amor Fati is related to thinking. It's absolutely got nothing to do with any kind of Stoicism or Epicureanism, as Nietzsche himself says in, in that book, actually. Um, but he does have a passage, which I won't read, on the Stoics and on Epicurus. It's something else entirely. It's got something to do with thinking itself. It's not really about how you live your life and just rationalize everything and everything's great and wonderful and I just love everything. No, Amor Fati means love of what is necessary, what is necessary in terms of thinking. This is why he quotes Descartes here. And this begins to make sense when you look towards the end of the book, which it, it, this book, the fourth book of the gay science, ends on Zarathustra. Again, I will end on the eternal recurrence of the same. And I'll say it again. It is also in the gay science that Nietzsche mentions, or proclaims rather, the death of God. And again, the consequences this has for our existence. 
in a godless universe. So it's got nothing to do at all with rationalizing or any kind of self-help. It's about appreciating the horror and tragedy at the heart of history. And also that we are now in a moment where thinking has pushed itself, and Nietzsche is intelligent enough to see that the uh, metaphysics of, of Descartes has had the consequence that has it was that it co contributed to the death of God, to the killing of God, because for Descartes, God is a, a mechanic, is is the is the mechanic that that allows for the clockwork to continue running, and hence, in a world in which God has disappeared, this ultimate horizon, as Nietzsche said, has been washed away. And we are now floating, as he says, in the passage on the death of God. What, what does such a world require? It doesn't require just to say, oh, this is great. I just approve of this because my career is going really well. I, I wonder what kind of, it's, it's the last man response to Amalfati is to turn it into some sort of a self-help principle. It's not at all then what it really is, which is, related profoundly to the eternal recurrence of the same, which is for Nietzsche the heaviest weight, as he calls it in section 341 of the gay signs of the Fröhliche Wissenschaft, das größte Schwergewicht, the heaviest weight meant to pull us down in this now free-floating um, universe, uh, the universe in which we are now free-floating because the ultimate horizon has God has been washed away and we have washed away the sun with it too, as he says, which means we've washed away. We've wiped away orientation, meaning. And meaning, um, so what you see here is, 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 a, is, is, a, is Nietzsche as a, a great thinker who sees, and he's got a very specific language, um, that in such a world, it's almost impossible to extremely difficult to appreciate suffering and tragedy. But that's exactly what we have to do in this kind of turning Amalfati into a rationalizing uh, principle where everything just becomes great and wonderful is exactly, there's not even the opposite. It's just so outside of what Nietzsche is trying to say. Uh, this kind of Panglossianism that you see with this is really not what Nietzsche meant. But, so let's uh, read again in honor of his um, day of death, this most wonderful passage, 341 in the fourth book of the Gay Signs. Das größte Schwergewicht, the heaviest weight. What if some day or night a demon were to steal into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life is you now live it, and have lived it, you will have to live once again, and innumerable times again. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain, and every joy, and every thought, and the sigh, and everything unspeakably small or great in your life must return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees. And even this moment and I, myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned over again and again. And you with it, speck of dust. Thus speaks the demon. Would you, then Nietzsche, would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth? and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god, and never have I heard anything more divine? If this thought gained power over you, as you are, it would transform and possibly crush you. The question in each and everything, the thought can crush you, are important. Do you want this again 
and innumerable times over would lie on your actions, would weigh down on your actions as the heaviest weight meant to pull us back down to earth. How well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to long for nothing more fervently than for this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal. And then the next and final passage of this fourth book, 342, begins with two words, in Kipit Tragedia. Tragedy begins. May tragedy begin. Tragedy shall rise again, which is the first page of the Zarathustra. So I won't get into this here, but the heaviest weight, the eternal recurrence of the same, as well as Amor Fati, this consequence of thinking, this consequence of uh, equating thinking and being, as Descartes does here, as of course is perfectly in line with the tradition. However, that thinking here now becomes purely subjective and representational also, and self-referential. Well, this is the consequence, one of the consequences, is the death of God which, according to Nietzsche, we have to affirm as beautiful, for it is necessary to live through this. Only then can at all can we at all begin to come out of nihilism, or else you just fall back into a subjective nihilism where you are trapped in uh, a certain dialectics, which is very easily engineerable and manageable. But the heaviest weight would pull down, which is the eternal recurrence of the same, meaning it would be, in, in well, a better translation actually is the eternal recurrence of the like, because das Gleiche, the Wikipedia is Gleichen in German, actually does allow for variation. So it's not about identity or sameness. It's not that everything is always the same. No, there's a likeness. And so that, for example, if one responds or acts differently in a given moment than one might have responded to earlier to a, in a similar situation, then this will recur in the next moment, in the next moments of one's life. So that which was the past, that which has been, is now viewed differently, which to some degree means that future really, the future really does have an impact on that which has been. So now, the future is remembered differently. So there's still room for variation, but again, in every moment, one's action will lead to every other moment in the future, and that will again impact every moment of one's past. And so we begin to see perhaps why this is such an important thought for Nietzsche in this moment of the death of God, of this utter wiping away of, um, well, that which held everything together and that which was a bulwark for him against nihilism. So I'll leave it at that for now. There will be a bit more in the, in the upcoming Nietzsche course uh, for which you can sign up or at least sign up for the newsletter for that in the link down below. Thank you very much for listening as always. Feel free to support the channel on Patreon or PayPal. Thanks very much indeed. All the best. Keep well.